and so I'm recording this. Share. Okay, so we're on the Andrew Jackson presidency PowerPoint right now, if you're following along. I and so where we're at today is picking up where we left off last week and hitting on this. So what you guys should remember from last week is how did America evolve towards greater democracy between 1800 and 1840? We talked about the growing sectionalism between the North and the South, how the North starting to rely on factories and Henry Clay's American systems, building up industry and canals and all of uh, roads up in the North where the South continues to grow basically based on agriculture. And then how did it grow as a democracy? And from that video that I showed you guys on Friday of the growing divide uh, in the United States, so John Quincy Adams beat Andrew Jackson in the presidency in 1824, okay, but really they were, nobody got enough votes to win, and then Henry Clay went to the House of Representatives and did what we call the corrupt bargain. All right, where he basically said, I'll be the secretary. If you'll give me a job in the cabinet, I'll whip up the votes here in the House of Representatives. So John Quincy Adams wins the presidency over Andrew Jackson in 1824. Well, the same two guys will run against each other again in 1828. How did Jackson win? Okay, from that video, Jackson, guys, it's an interesting parallel with a week before the election. Jackson essentially won uh, – the same way Donald Trump did, okay, in a sense that he said that he is the he is the voice for the common man, okay, which is ironic because you know Trump's been wealthy his whole life, but Jackson was a war hero, I right? but Jackson was also like the idea is that I'm just I'm not a lifelong politician, you know what I'm saying? I'm just a good old boy from Tennessee. Uh, military hero whatever and as america you when when the constitution and up through the early 1800s really to be able to vote you had to be wealthy and you had to be able to be a white landowner well what starts to change is suffrage starts to change in the 1800s by what is suffrage guys ability to do what when we talk about women's suffrage or or african-american suffrage it was right to vote well, what starts to change from a suffrage movement is all white men are now allowed to vote pretty much, not just the wealthy, rich, white landowners. And Jackson really resonates with them, especially in the South and in the West. And he will beat John Quincy Adams in the election of 1828. And Jackson really changes the presidency uh, in a sense, unlike the first six guys who, who owned it. And, and, and I mean, he owned the office in a sense that he probably expanded the powers of the presidency more so than anybody in American history up until that point. Uh, by using the veto more and more, by shutting down uh, certain things, by uh, the Indian Removal Act, which we'll get into. We'll talk about all this stuff that happens. So, you know, so how did America change from 1800s to 1830s? You guys look like down here, how, who could vote? So if you were universal white suffrage, by white male suffrage was orange, okay? So in the 1800, only Kentucky and Vermont would allow all whites to vote. You had to be a property owner in green, the only two states that you really had to be a property owner by 1830 were North Carolina and Tennessee. Most people, if you paid taxes at that point, were able to vote. And that's what happens when um, Jackson comes up. So now 80.2% of common white men are allowed to vote by 1840. John, I hit on this. John Quincy Adams wins in 1824, but Andrew Jackson had won the popular vote even then. So when they end up running again, uh, Jackson's going to wipe him out in 1828. This changed American politics because really, essentially, as more of these just common white men, Randy, get off your phone, please. More of these common white men could vote. Okay, Jackson starts to take over. And you can see right here, man, he wipes, uh, he wipes John Quincy Adams out because all of those states in blue vote for him and all the states in brown vote for 
John Quincy Adams. So who is Andrew Jackson? Guys, like I said, he's considered the first common man president. He was born poor and uneducated. He educates himself. Now he is a, he's a soldier. He's a young soldier during the American Revolution. Okay, so I mean, he's an older guy at this point because this is 40 or 50 years after the American Revolution. And he's born in the West. By the West, I mean, what he's the first president not born from one of the original 13 colonies. So up until that point, Washington, Madison, Jefferson, and Monroe had all been from Virginia, and John, John Adams and John Quincy Adams had been from Massachusetts. Jackson is from Tennessee, which was not one of the original 13 colonies. He's from Nashville, and he educates himself and becomes a lawyer. Of course, he's a war hero, but he's seen as the man of the people. Okay, it doesn't help. It doesn't hurt him that he won probably the most famous battle of the War of 1812, the Battle of New Orleans, and he ends up. Uh, he had earned the nickname in the in the War of 1812 that he his lines would not be broken. They were as strong as a hickory tree, you know. And if y'all know anything about a hickory tree, it's a really strong wood. So he earns the nickname Old Hickory. You know, that's old hickory just kind of holding firm. And he, he just becomes kind of this legend of the common man. Well, what he ends up doing, remember, guys, the era of good feelings, the, the, the Federalist Party is dead at this point. But Jackson being elected essentially divides his party in half, okay, where the South and the West follow him, and it's the formation of – what we would know as the Democratic Party. Um, and he hopes to return to the Jeffersonian ideas, the protection of life, liberty, and of course, westward expansion. And still sitting beneath the surface in all of this as America expands westward is the idea, will slavery expand with America? Everybody with me? So it increases the sectional divide with uh, Jefferson, but during his eight years in office, Andrew Jackson greatly expanded presidential power. And what happens to Jackson is as he expands presidential power, this other political party starts to form mainly in the North called the Whigs. And we return to the two party system. The Whigs are going to last for about 20 years or so. And then eventually the Republicans will be born out of the Whig party. And that's how we get the Democrat versus Republican party everybody with me so what did jackson do okay who was he you guys can see he develops these enormous political rivalries up top with henry clay remember he hates henry clay because henry clay had cost him the first presidency all right henry clay hated jackson because if you look back in the war of 1812 jackson had told everybody that these people from Kentucky, which is where Henry Clay was from, were a bunch of softies and they were cowards. They didn't fight valiantly. So Clay takes offense to him. Clay ends up costing him the presidency. Then there's a guy named Daniel Webster, who we'll talk more of when we talk about the slavery issue. And then, of course, John Quincy Adams, who he ran across. Jackson believes in state and local aut autonomy. He does not want the elite to be involved. He thinks that he should basically, this is a government for the common people. He actually opens up the White House more so than any other president. Like if you wanted a meeting with the president, you could just go to Washington and have a meeting with him. It sounds all fine and dandy. He's got a lot of, he's got a lot of support in the South and the West and with the middle class and small farmers, also urban laborers. All right. Who was against him were kind of the rich elite, all right? And he was not good toward African American slaves and Native Americans, Native Americans especially. All right? It's even been debated on whether or not the guy should be on the $20 bill right now because of how harsh he was. Like when he was after the War of 1812, the dude just leads a small army into Florida and attacks the Seminole Indians. Just, I mean, he wasn't authorized by the government or anything. He just did it. Everybody with me? So the other thing where Jackson 
<laughs> this is where it's uh, – I don't know if y'all know this, but Donald Trump employs both of his sons and his son-in-law as members of his campaign, and that's called nepotism if, it, if they're seen as unqualified. Jackson has what you call the spoil system. So if Shane helped me on my campaign and I'm Andrew Jackson – and Shane's in North Carolina or whatever, I might give Shane's little son a job once I get into the White House, despite his son probably being remotely unqualified. And what happens in the spoil system, I spoiled you rotten. That's what it essentially means. If you were a supporter of mine, I was going to find a way for you to have a job. That's fine and dandy if Shane's son is qualified. But if Shane's son becomes the whatever department head of the department of commerce and he's got no commercial background we're going to end up having a disaster the other thing with jackson's presidency that's ironic is is that he ran as a common man folk he understood like the military and foreign policy but he don't understand the economy at all so that's going to be a disaster the other thing why this spoil system is so ironic is because remember how he lost the election of 1824 is because John Quincy Adams gave Henry Clay a job in his cabinet and he screamed, this is patronage. This is a corrupt bargain. Well, he ends up becoming the president. He does the same thing. The problem with me offering Shane's son a job is exactly what happened in, in Jackson's government. He not only did he get loyalists, he got people who were completely unqualified for their job, too. So it led to government corruption and inefficiency. Uh, his two term presidency. So he's elected twice was defined by three major conflicts. The first one is the Native Americans, okay? And in Wooster versus Georgia, the Cherokee, the Cherokee Indians, which in this, the Cherokee are all over the Carolinas, South Carolina, and Georgia, okay? Jackson's trying to remove them from that land. And the Supreme Court says you can't do that. They own their land. Jackson basically throws his middle finger up at the Supreme Court. All right, and eventually it's going to lead to the Cherokee being removed in the Trail of Tears during the Martin Van Buren presidency. Americans were spreading west in search of land to of new land to cultivate. The discovery of gold in North Georgia led Georgia government to seize Cherokee land. Civilized tribes stood in the south. They stood in the way of westward expansion. So the Cherokee and all these Native Americans that were still here that had, that had debunked America white men coming in, they're finally going to fight, and at Jackson's not going to have any of it. Everybody with me? All right, so Congress passed, and Jackson signs the Indian Removal Act of 1830, forcing all Indian tribes to relocate west of the Mississippi River. Everybody with me? So not good. He's essentially sending them on their way. In 1838, his successor, Martin Van Buren, orders the U.S. Army to force Cherokees west on the Trail of Tears and forcing them this is essentially commits genocide because a fourth of the Cherokees die on the way to Oklahoma. And by the 1830s, guys, the other thing that's going on is sectionalism is becoming more obvious, okay, especially over the use of tariffs. And I always have to explain what tariffs are again. Tariffs are a tax on imported and exported goods. The northern states wanted tariffs because it forced the south with all the cotton to do business with the factories in the north because the tariff they would have to pay is if they did business with England or France or whoever. So I want to do business with Randy, but he's in Britain. The government's going to tax me more to do business with him. Shane likes that because now I have to do business with him up in the north. Everybody with me on that? So the South is growing increasingly pissed off, and Congress passes what is becomes known to the Southerners as a tariff of abominations. Southern states claim that their, their states' uh, rights were violated, and the vice president of the United States is a guy named John C. Calhoun, whose son-in-law's name was Thomas Clemson, Clemson University. 
he basically resigns the vice presidency at this point, okay, and then will go back in the Senate and basically tells Jackson, hit, hit the president, that we will nullify and we will secede from the Union if this thing is not overturned. We will not follow this. Jackson is crazy like a fox, all right? The problem with threatening Jackson that you're going to do that is he would have had no problem calling out the military. All right? Calhoun supported nullification, meaning the states didn't have to follow it. Calhoun believed as a last resort, states could succeed, secede from the Union. Y'all know what secede means? Leave. All right. President Jackson did not support the tariff either, but he saw nullification as a threat to the, United, the unity of the USA. Jackson urged Congress to pass to force the bill to enforce the tariff. The nullification crisis came to an end when that guy shows up again, Henry Clay, and he introduces a lower tariff in a compromise of 1833. It does ease uh, tensions immediately, but you guys can see even before the slavery situation showed up, not showed up, but before it starts to rise through the 1830s and the 1840s, the North and the South were already on separate pages. The South used states' rights to argue that secession was possible. Jackson was willing to use force. The third conflict of Jackson's presidency was his war against the Second Bank of the United States. Jackson thought um, that the Bank of the U.S. was unconstitutional and gave too much power to the elite. Uh, Clay and Biddle supported the rechartering of the Bank of the U.S., and Jackson vetoed the bank, uh, which eventually would kill. Uh, so the Second Bank of the U.S. ends up ending. The biggest thing that happens at the end of Jackson's presidency, and you see this a lot with two-term presidents, whether or not it was George W. Bush or even Barack Obama, uh, and, and especially Ronald Reagan, is that after eight years of, or six or seven years of economic growth, eventually a bubble, you had an economic bubble, well, a bubble eventually does what, guys? It pops. And the depression, a panic of 1837 hits when banks scaled back and it lending and it raised interest rates and we, we end up going into economic depression in 1837. But like if you look at what the problem is and I'm winding down. So Jackson represented a new era of American democracy. He and the Democratic Party represented the will of the common man, but his use of the spoil system, the veto power, uh, stand against states' rights, strengthen the power of the president. Opposition ended up leading to the Whigs and the return of the two-party system. Like if you look at that picture there on the left, that that was seen all over the states as like when he started to become unpopular, that he treated the presidency like a king. And if you notice what he's holding in his left hand, that's a veto. He used the veto more than any president in history up until that point. Everybody with me? So it was seen kind of as an abuse of power. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to get into it, but like the, the Jackson presidency is essentially a, those three crises, and then Martin Van Buren after him was the Trail of Tears. So Jackson is, he was loved by so many, but he was also hated. Sound familiar? You know, it's very, very, it's kind of the 1800s version of Donald Trump, with the exception of Jackson had proven in his previous years, and I don't mean this to sound like a detriment to President Trump, I don't want you to think of it like that, but like Jackson had proven he was a badass. Everybody got me. I mean, like he was a legitimate badass as a soldier. Uh, but, you know, history is very, very conflicting on what kind of president he was just because of the way he treated the Native Americans. Uh, but he did squelch any talk of secession earlier, um, you know, and and he's he's very, very important to the history of America for what he did as a civilian and then what he did as a president. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. What I have done, let me stop. what I have done, uh, I have posted an assignment 